Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is T. Bui, artist and author of the illustrated memoir, The Best We Could Do, a chronicle of her family's journey from war-torn Vietnam to America. Bui was a public high school teacher for over 10 years. She's been a lecturer in the Comics MFA program at California College of the Arts since 2015. The Best We Could Do is the University of Oregon's common reading book for 2018-2019. The common reading program builds community, enriches curriculum, and engages research through the shared reading of an important book every year. While Bui was on campus January 30th to February 1st, 2019, she gave readings and engaged in discussions with students and faculty. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So the first question, I think, is what, what led you to write this memoir? How did, you, how did that journey begin for you? Um, <clears throat> I began it when I was a much younger person, so it was an origin story or a search for an origin story um, because I am a child of refugees. I actually came here as a small child as a refugee myself. So th there are certain things in my family's mythology. Every family has a mythology, and I was trying to understand mine better. Um, and I was also, as a graduate student, a little frustrated with what I had found or the limits on, of, of what I had found. Um, the pers perspectives tended to be um, very American-centric, um, male-centric, soldier-centric. Mm -hmm. um, those didn't reflect my family's experience at all. So um, I set out to make what had been missing for me as a mirror growing up. Um, and I found that there were many people like me so um, I was encouraged by the idea that what I made could possibly be useful to more people than just myself and my family. So you, when you started this project, it did not start as a graphic memoir. It started as a traditional oral history because I was doing it for uh, grad school. And so I was really um, interested in like transcribing faithfully everything that was said, all the ums and ahs, and I had to translate as well. And then the sad part about when the culmination of all of that work is that nobody reads it because it's a little boring, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, only your thesis advisor and you and maybe a few people who are trying to support you will ever read it. And I thought that was such a shame to do with such rich material. So I was looking around at other ways to possibly make it accessible to a wider audience. And that was, that was a time where I came upon some really amazing graphic novels, like Mouse um, by Art Spiegelman that deals with the Holocaust, and Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi, which is also a personal and political historical narrative. Um, and they seemed so accessible. Mm -hmm. And I, I have an art background and a political science background and a writing, uh, I, I always wrote. So I thought, oh, I could do this because they seemed but so accessible. But you had accessible. never done any comics It was the most that. arrogant decision ever <laughs> to make. Um, and it, that's why it took so long because comics are really hard to do, it turns out. Um, it took me over 10 years to feel like I knew what I was doing. I think I was on chapter eight by the time I felt like I was competent. Can you explain a little bit more when you say comics are really hard to do. What are some of the challenges? First, what are the, some of the challenges of doing comics in general? And then what were the particular kinds of challenges that you confronted? For somebody who doesn't like to repeat themselves, it's very challenging to draw yourself, you know, hundreds of times in sequential panels. Um, it's also hard to break down a story into um, so many concrete moments, mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with uh, not your own memories, but other people's memories that you have to reconstruct from a lot of research. So I didn't, have, I didn't have home videos. I didn't have um, even many photographs from Vietnam. So I had to do a lot of background research just to be able to draw a panel that was historically accurate. Um, so there's a lot of background research that most people just take for granted because it's just a nice picture. Mm -hmm. So what you read in two hours is actually like 12 years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so say a little bit more about the kind of research you had to do and the challenges that you were faced with this research. Um, well, it helps to have a father who has a, a memory like a steel trap. So certain keywords were um, really useful for me to be able to find images that, that corresponded. Like my father remembered the name of the U.S. ship that mm. took him from the north to the south in 1955. Mm. And so he was blown away when I just Googled it. And I found <laughs> the ship and its, and its history. And I showed him a picture just to verify that that was the one. And he was like, yes, how did you find it? Mm. Little things like that. Um, lots of archival research, other people's home movies, um, f f uh, movies that are not made by Americans, um, gave me a better sense of uh, 
clothing over, over the decades from the 40s to the present. Um, going back to Vietnam myself and seeing things through my own eyes um, so that I could, you know, uh, there's a difference in, in what people look at, whether they're an, an accountant or an artist. And so I had to um, go back and look with my own eyes at things like the foliage or the the way the clouds are, are denser in a tropical country. Um, and those kind of things helped me put my own, uh, my own eyes, if you, for, for lack of a better way to explain it, mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the story that my parents told me. I know from reading the story that the, the, the research that you did with your parents, mm -hmm. this is your efforts to access their narratives, was complicated because of the trauma that the, the, the various traumas that both of them sure. suffered. Mm -hmm. And you, one of the things I think is really interesting about this particular graphic memoir is that you, th well, I'm an English professor, so I'll use a fancy word. You thematize those problematics, those challenges, mm -hmm. because um, you can narrate not only their story, but the story of your efforts to access that story and the kind of ways in which you had to go back and forth between the two of them to reconstruct this narrative because neither of their accounts were uh, uh, full, full enough for you. Right. Um, one of the subtexts of the story, or it's a kind of framing narrative in the story, is that it starts being about the coming of your child mm -hmm. and it ends with that story. So say a little bit about why that frame was an important part of the narrative for you. I think this is always a narrative. This is this has always been a narrative that I used in my writing, um, and I haven't been conscious about it up until recently, because mm. uh, it gets pointed out to me a lot. Mm. <laughs> um, but I think it's because I I see life as a circle. You start out uh, in this place of ignorance a little bit, and then you have to do the full circle of being a, a jerk until you come back to the same place and um, realize what you had in the first place. Um, or, or at least that's the trajectory of growing up, like going from, a, being from, going from being just a kid to having a kid was a full circle for me and it was the circle that made it possible for me to feel like I could handle this material. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I started before I was a parent um, and I sat on the material for a long time because it just felt too big. Um, and it was the act of becoming a parent myself that um, made me feel entitled or empowered. Mm. Maybe empowered is a better word to um, to tackle it. Um, so it just made sense to take the reader right there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I always had the um, the beginning and end in mind as I was writing. The middle chapters, I wasn't sure where it was going to go. Mm. My outline was very abstract, um, had a lot of water themes. Mm. Um, I don't know how my publisher knew what I was going to make, but they trusted me. Mm. Interesting, interesting. So let's talk a little bit about the title of the book. How did mm. you settle on that? And tell us about the journey you took to that title. Um, it took a while uh, to get to the best we could do. Um, before that, it was Refugee Reflex as a working title, but I, but I always knew that was kind of an ugly title. It sounds like reflux, and um, I was pretty sure that it was about more than being a refugee. Um, and so it was when I, was a, I had become a parent, and I was moving from New York, where I had you know, spent my freewheeling 20s, um, and I was moving back to California to be closer to my own family as a parent. Um, and then I was rearranging my life so that my mother could move into the backyard, my father could move nearby. And all of this adulting um, made me realize that my concerns were now about being that sandwich generation and trying to, trying to do better, um, dealing with my own inherited trauma so that I wouldn't pass it on to my son, the responsibility of that. So, um, and then at the same time feeling a lot of empathy for mm -hmm. my poor parents mm -hmm. um, dealing with me growing up and, and my siblings. So the best we could do is like the summation of um, how I see parenting. I just have a lot of sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the form of the, the book. Mm -hmm. So 
you've you've made a choice uh, in terms of the color that was used. So it's a it's um what do you call I, I don't know what the term that you use. It's it has one range of additional colors besides black mm -hmm. and grays. It's a kind of a sepia, an orangey sepia. Why did you choose that palette? Um, I always wanted a warm colored book. Mm. So I tried about 10 or 12 different Pantone colors. So spot, spot printing is what the okay. term that you're looking for. Um, and we do it in cartooning because it's cheap. Mm, um, right. More, cheaper than f uh, three color or four, four color. Four color, yeah. Four color is really expensive to print. Um, and the initial plan was for a black and white book. And it wasn't until halfway through that I started asking if I could have any color. Um, and then it was a question of what color would work. So I tested it out on three different kinds of paper, um, looked at a, sort of a gold and a more brown and a, a more pink red. But the color has to work in the, in the range of 10%, all the, all the way to 100%. So it was really just like trying things out and seeing what felt right. And in the end, what felt right was something that um, looked a little bit like the orange building that I grew up in, mm. in San Diego, mm. and also looked a little, or felt a little bit like uh, the photographs, family photographs from the 70s, where the, the colors starting to get weird, you know, and mm -hmm. like the, it, they all look like they're sunblasted. Um, yeah, it's the color of nostalgia mm. for me. And interesting, and interesting. And sentimental. So were there particular things that you learned from your parents during this process that were really surprising to you, that you, I mean, I know that in every family there are some information that is passed on quite readily, mm. but it's clear from the narrative that, that there were certain things that you didn't know, and when you were doing this, you learned these things. Were some of these particularly surprising? I mean, it's clear that in some cases, you saw your parents in new lights because of what you learned. Are there a couple of those you could tell us about that were particularly powerful for you? Uh, I'm going to give you kind of a disappointing answer. Okay, that, like, I was not actually all that surprised. Ah. Um, I think that uh, I grew up with a lot of the stories, and they were told to me at sometimes inappropriate moments, like you know when you're getting ready to getting ready for school or like eating dinner is not really when you're ready to absorb your parents' traumatic stories. Mm -hmm. um, but they're there, and then later on when you're more ready as an adult and have a microphone and a recording device, mm -hmm. then then you ask again. Um, but because you've already had that initial exposure growing up, like, I think the, 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 the shock is dulled. Mm -hmm. And then definitely when you are drawing these stories, um, you spend so many, like, countless hours with them. So at this point, I'm like, I can't recall a single thing that was surprising to me, even though there's, there, it, it would seem like I should be surprised mm. by some of it. Um, in some ways, doing this project helps me see all the ways in which we are weird. Everyone's weird. Everyone mm -hmm. has strange stories. And there's no normal. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that one of the things that prompted this project was a sense of dissatisfaction in the narratives that you had heard about the Vietnam War and mm -hmm. its legacy. Mm -hmm. um, say First, can you say some of the the limitations of those narratives from your perspective? Yeah. Um, they're, they tend to be very s cliched um, representations of somebody like me, a, Viet a Vietnamese woman, um, have been pretty much limited to uh, the role of a bar girl, a prostitute, um, a tragic mother, usually a villager, um, no one from the city like my parents, um, usually someone un uneducated who gets saved by a white American soldier. It's like the classic um, Madame Butterfly mm -hmm. story. Um, and you know, even if those narratives are beautiful, like the same ones repeated over and over again create this problem for every other kind of experience. Um, and then for Vietnamese men, it's like even harsher because they don't get saved or they usually get killed. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like it, the, when you only get three or four parts in a, in a story that's supposedly about you and your country and this conflict that happened in your country, um, eventually you have to break out of, uh, out of the, the cliches and create something more nuanced. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a, gr it's a graphic memoir, but it's also a kind of, in the midst of it, it's a graphic history. I mean, I think most Americans who would read this 
will learn about the history of Vietnam that they knew nothing about. That was my hope, yeah. yeah. I mean, you have the one image of that very famous photo of uh, when the Americans were departing, mm -hmm. which is the, if most Americans, they know that probably. Right. But the history of Vietnam that you, the 20th century history that the book also in, includes, it's a, it's a fascinating, rich, and complex history. What were some of the challenges you felt, faced in trying to communicate that kind of complexity and that variety? I mean, there's so many different parts of that history, so many different chapters, you might say, in that history. Right, right. Um, probably the biggest challenge doing that in the comics medium is uh, cutting down your word count. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's maybe 50,000 words in the whole book, and so how do you encapsulate 40 years of history of a country that mm. many readers are not going to be familiar with. Um, an, an illustrated timeline was helpful, and mm -hmm. I added that to the paperback. Yep, yep, yep. Um, let's see. Other than that, for me, it was um, trying to put myself in the shoes of, like, say, a high schooler, mm -hmm. trying to make, you know, stay awake through history class. I know I didn't like history class when I was a kid, and then later on I fell in love with history because mm -hmm. I understood it to be the story of people. Um, so I treated it as the story of some characters that you got to know and, and loved, and you, you would naturally want to know what was going on around them when certain important things were happening to them. So it was always um, my parents in the foreground and then Vietnam's history in the background and how the two interacted. Yeah, that, that part of it is really, I mean, it, it shows why one of the things that's amazing about this book is that it is a tremendously educational book. Great. That um, makes the public school teacher in me happy. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you, th when you, you just said that when you were thinking about this problem of the history, you were thinking about the high school kid. Mm -hmm. Did you have a, a kind of ideal reader in your mind when you were constructing the narrative? No, I was writing for a plurality of readers. Um, I don't think it's a good idea anymore to write always from the perspective of the minority who's translating mm -hmm. themselves to the majority, because mm -hmm. that doesn't, that's not the world that we're going to live in very soon. And we're on the cusp of, of exciting times where there won't be a dominant majority culture. Um, and so it's almost perpetuating that to keep writing from the margins. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I have to learn how to take up space, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and, and many writers do. Um, but at the same time, I knew that there were people who were not Vietnamese American like me, or didn't know the history, or maybe couldn't read the words in Vietnamese, and they were part of my audience too. And that's the teacher in me thinking, mm -hmm. how do I differentiate for a very diverse group? Um, so I try to put access points in for different people. If you can't identify with the immigrant experience, you can certainly identify with um, the experience of being someone's child mm -hmm. or someone's parent. Mm -hmm. So there's something for everybody to enter the story with. And I assume that that's the reason why, although it's clear from the narrative that the characters are speaking in a variety of languages throughout the narrative. The yeah, actually that's just a reflection of Vietnam. Yes. Yeah. But in the narrative itself, in mm -hmm. the book itself, the majority of speech is in English. Right. And I assume you, you made that translation choice for this purpose of... Um, no, I mean, English is really my first language. Mm -hmm. It's the language that I dream in. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the language that I write into. And then Vietnamese and French are languages that I have acquired or, or are secondary for me. Um, but your parents were speaking Vietnamese when they to were To me, the, yeah, in yeah. the interviews. So yes, then yes, I had yeah. to transcribe and translate those. Right. And I feel like I lost a little bit in the translation, honestly. Like, I can't, I can't quite explain how um, lively their voices are mm -hmm. in the translations. Mm -hmm. Though you speak at a couple of points about their voices, I, I remember. And in the final passage of the narrative, you actually include Vietnamese and then an English translation of that Vietnamese. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it was really emotional for me. I, c I couldn't actually speak Vietnamese to my son when he was first born without crying. <laughs> it made me realize how much is um, wrapped up in a yeah. language. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also that was an important um, thing for me to uh, use Vietnamese in the book with diacritical marks because so often um, they're not used and 
you can do that now. You can make fonts that have diacritical marks so that Vietnamese readers can actually read the words and mm -hmm. know how to say them. Yes, I think a lot of Americans don't know what diacritical marks are. Yeah, they look like squiggles and hats and enyes and, and, and up and down accent marks over the letters. Um, and, you know, to, a, to the untrained eye, they're just extras but to um, an actual reader of Vietnamese, they tell you how to pronounce a word. Mm -hmm. And if you pronounce it wrong, it changes the meaning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is in some ways an extremely personal narrative mm -hmm. that tells these stories of your parents and your family. How have your parents and your siblings responded to the book? They're okay with it, but the, <laughs> the short answer is they still love me. <laughs> 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 um, they're very supportive and I had their permission to do it otherwise I don't think I would have dared. Um, I was very lucky in the sense that I had two parents who were talkers. And I know from touring this book that a lot of people in my situation have parents who won't talk at all. Yes, yes. So my family and I are happy to air our dirty laundry so that other people can talk about difficult subjects. Um, we're sort of the, the cracker barrel around which you, <laughs> you can stand and, and have have question, have uh, conversations about PTSD. <laughs> have your relationships with them, or has their relationships relationship with you changed? You feel because of that? I think I understand them a lot better now. Um, but that's a fleeting thing, kind of like happiness, right? You get there <laughs> and then whew, it's gone. Um, that understanding. I, we had some really amazing times. Um, it was doing the book was a sneaky way to spend quality time with my parents. Um, and then you go back to fighting again, you know? <laughs> we're, we're just, <laughs> we're, we're a very regular family in, mm -hmm. in that way. <laughs> has, has the book's acclaim changed your life? Uh, yes, in very practical ways. Um, I'm, I'm not teaching high school anymore. Um, I go back to try to help out the school. Um, I get to be a nomad, which has been a dream. Um, so I, there's nothing I love more than talking to people and asking questions about themselves. Um, I actually hate talking about myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would think that that's one of the hardest things about this. It is really success. hard. The book was not meant to be a memoir. It was, it was an oral history where I do the question asking. Um, but the book needed a protagonist to mm -hmm. guide the reader. And so, oops, a memoir. Um, and yeah, so this is like, this is, this is a role that I am just constantly skirting around. Um, there is a way in, this, in which this book is extremely timely in the United States of our moment. Couldn't have predicted that. You could not have predicted mm -mm. it, but it really, it, it's so timely. It speaks so urgently to what's happening in our country. Can you say a little bit about what your thoughts are about the current rhetoric about immigrants in the United States? Um, well, it's not new. Um, there have, like, the U.S. has had waves of intense xenophobia in the past where we've created laws or rounded up people and locked them up um, based on their nationality or appearance. Um, and so I feel like this is just another iteration of that problem that we've had, that we as in the US has had since, since its inception. Um, I think that every country is a work in progress, but I also think that um, having a historical perspective doesn't mean that you also just let things be. Mm -hmm. And so I'm doing what I can to illuminate the, the relationship between the past and the present and I'll illuminate perspectives and experiences that haven't been um, paid attention to so that we can tackle the problem of understanding each other and sharing, sharing space, which is really essentially the problem. Um, but we live in a world where uh, people perceive there to be diminishing resources and so it does feel a little bit like there's a sinking ship and the rats are starting to eat each other, um, which is a scary time because, you know, anybody can fall into the trap of fearing the other and, and then doing very harmful things to protect their own. Um, parents mm -hmm. will do anything to protect their children and if they believe that there is a, a force out there um, that's after their kids or their kids' future or their family's well-being, they will, they will kill. Um, and it's, it's, it's very dangerous when we have politicians who play upon that fear. Um, and it's unnecessary, really. Have you found 
from talking to the readers of the book that you've encountered over this past few months, have you found that the messages that you were hoping would be communicated are being communicated? Do they testify to that? Um, maybe it's because I don't have a, a real agenda with the book. Um, maybe, yeah. I think that people see that I'm not here to hammer them over the head with mm -hmm. like a 10 point agenda. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to make them vote a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just telling my story and presenting myself as a fellow human being um, who came here with a bunch of fellow human beings that shared a similar story. And then the fact that, you know, we came under certain circumstances that are familiar now, hopefully shed some light on who these people are, who come on boats, who, you know, cross borders. Um, the news represents them in a variety of ways, and all of them are kind of limited, um, which is one of the reasons why the, f the one page that has photographs mm -hmm. of my family mm -hmm as boat people, um, I don't show you that until almost the end of the book mm -hmm. so that you get to know us as whole human beings before you see us as boat people. Mm -hmm. um, the news is so quickly moving and it's so short that we only see people who are trying to get to the, into the country as like their most desperate and we don't understand them to be these whole human beings who've read, led rich lives and have very good reasons for fleeing their countries and wanting to relocate here. So we have just about a minute left. My last question is, what are you working on now? Um, working on a story about deportation and Southeast Asians. Um, working on a children's book that's more fun than that. <laughs> and um, a few side projects that I can't talk about yet. Okay, well, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. I've been speaking with T. Bui, the artist and author of the illustrated memoir, The Best We Could Do. Her book is the University of Oregon's Common Reading for 2018-2019. Thanks so much for watching.